Welcome to Sobcast the Podcast, where I, Christina Wolfgram, beg the question, what even is mental health? This podcast is created in collaboration with Dive Through, a mental wellness company that actually knows what they're talking about. Even though Sobcast the Podcast is about the pursuit of good mental health, we will be talking about some not so good mental health things like anxiety, depression, and collective trauma, which is today's topic. And it's kind of a big one, folks. We are going to be talking about September 11th and World War II and COVID and 2020 and feelings. Today, I have a wonderful guest named Dr. Raghu Apasani. He is a psychiatrist in Los Angeles, and I do not know when he has time to sleep because he is constantly taking care of patients at multiple locations. He is working on all this research about brains and emotions and how to help people. And then he's also involved with all these different like foundations and organizations and companies that make amazing natural gummies that help your brain with aminos, something about aminos. I'm so lucky that he came to talk with us today because I don't want to shock you, but I myself am not a doctor. I know. Just take a second to process that. Okay, thank you. Collective trauma has been a phrase that I've been seeing so much and I have so many questions when we think about big events that we all felt traumatized from collective trauma I think some of the uh, biggest ones that come up are definitely like events where lots and lots and lots of people lost their lives and people lost loved ones and innocent people didn't make it through the day. There are also events like Princess Diana's death, I think affected a lot of people. Um, My producer was telling me about the Humboldt Broncos bus crash, which is an event in Canada that I think shook people right in their hearts and it happened in 2018 and involved a bus sitting in a major horrible tragic car accident basically and the way that he described it was this is an event where anyone in Canada Um, can remember exactly where they were when they heard about it. And to me, that is kind of sort of my not doctor, not expert way of defining collective trauma and collectively traumatic events is something where you can remember exactly where you were and you can remember who you were worried about and you carry that with you for the rest of your life among all of these other things like emotion and jaw clenching apparently i do so i will stop gabbing and i will let dr ragu apasani take it from here okay so um do you want to talk about collective trauma how's that sound it sounds like a good idea, given that we're all experiencing it in so many forms. I know. I actually um, started crying before we even started talking. So I got us off to a really good start there. Yeah. <laughs> Just a you know, day in the I, life. <laughs> exactly. And uh, I, where do you want to start? I mean, you know, I, obviously current events, the past 15 18 months has led to a whole collective trauma globally, but you know, we've also all generations before us have also experienced it. And I think 
you and I, our own generation, we experienced significant collective trauma when we were younger with 9-11, um, other events, and then there's collective trauma that gets passed down intergenerationally as well that I'm sure you might have heard about. You know what? I think I heard about it and then try to forget about it immediately, but we should get <laughs> into that. I guess like my first question is really basic. Just like what is collective trauma? Like, how do you know what, when it's happening? Yeah, it, you know, it's a term that's definitely getting floated around a lot. Uh, it's, so it's not really a new term either. The way that I try to think about collective trauma is that it's a shared experience of helplessness, of disorientation, and, you know, of loss and, and grief um, amongst a group of people. And that group of people can be, you know, specific in terms of sexual orientation or ethnicity or race or geographical, but it can also just be a very diverse group, but it's something that really affects some type of group of, of people. And when you're seeing patients, let's take this past year, for example, how can you tell when they're dealing with a collective trauma versus just a very personal trauma? Mm. It's a good question. So I, I try to think of collective trauma as one that it, it shatters basic fabrics of society, right? So unlike just a loss in one person's life or something like that, it's something that happens, which actually changes the definition of what is meaningful across multiple people or across a group. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I think that when I'm looking specifically at, at trauma, we're looking at the response that someone's having in terms of their symptoms. And you can categorize that, categorize that into sort of if they're hyperactive, right? And that reactivity increases when they're faced with more stress or if they shut down and go into this sort of numbness and, and sense of indifference. So we really have to try to understand those two components when somebody comes into the, into the office or into the clinic and you see how they're reacting to stress and then see how people in their own community or you know, in their own geographical region are also reacting to the same stress. And if you see that that individual's particularly has more intensified symptoms, then they're probably being much more affected by that trauma. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one way to really look at it. And, you know, essentially like trauma is taking a loan from our own future, right? So what that means is that you're in a traumatic situation, you become so overwhelmed that you then end up becoming numb as a way to survive. And that trauma response is in a way like a very intelligent function that we have ingrained into our nervous systems, right? But it comes at a price and it comes at the price that we have to pay it back at some point with interest. So a lot of the research around trauma over the past couple of decades has started to look at the types of attachment stress or styles that we've had as, as children, right? And how mm -hmm. those have became, become integrated into us through forms of neglect or abuse that we might not have recognized because cognitively, because we were children or babies, like what do babies do? They like eat, poop, and sleep, you know? That's what we think. Yeah. But they're also very emotionally attuned humans. Yeah. And all of that adversity and all of those experiences then start to live deep within your bodies. And those are the things that are activating your nervous system subconsciously when you then go back into these traumatic experiences. So coming to your question of how do you know if it's the individual dealing with the trauma versus a collective dealing with the trauma is looking at the reactivity of what their symptoms are like when they're faced with stress in their life. Mm. And, but it's still important regardless, even if it's collective trauma to work with people on an individual basis because the frameworks and the fabric of their life and their minds and their bodies is so dependent on when they were in the womb to their childhood and their infancy and their young adulthood and their entire life. And that's unique to that one individual. Wow, that 
feels like it covers so much ground and also for me makes me a little anxious because it feels so out of control like I was a baby I couldn't do anything about it like um huh I want to talk a little bit about September 11th really quick um Mm -hmm. because that happened when we were kind of kids and I remember I have a sister who's seven years younger than me and I thought I was being like a big grown up the way I was handling it just kind of like I'm going to comfort other people I don't know trying to trying to be a small adult which is probably should have been a a key (laughs) uh symptom that it should have brought me into therapy but um I remember her saying that she had really she was having really bad dreams about planes and I remember like my family we were all kind of looking at each other like what on earth how on earth do you explain this to a little kid like because we couldn't even understand it we couldn't even wrap our heads around it so I mean in that case and in cases that you've seen that this past year like how can you help somebody else deal with something when you yourself don't even understand it. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, as you, as you brought up like September 11th, I was just thinking about where I was yeah. when it happened. And I remember sitting, I think I was like in sixth grade sitting on the floor in gym class Yeah, and we all got dismissed to go home. Um, and my older brother was actually at home at that time. He mm-hmm. um, was like six and a half years older than me. Oh, no way. Um, the thing about, so the thing about 9-11, right, is that it caused a collective trauma in a different way than COVID caused a collective trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, with COVID, it's sort of this ongoing pandemic versus with 9-11, it was like immediate, right? There was the majority of the major events around 9-11 happened on the same day. Mm -hmm. And then there was sort of this ripple effect of attacks that remained with us for much longer than that and trying to understand what happened. And that's really where a lot of that fear and that anticipation comes from Um, and feeling a loss of control, right? Like when we feel that we've either lost life for a you know, large definition of what that is. And when we have prolonged anxiety, it's really difficult. And that anxiety comes from a lack of understanding why something has happened. Mm-hmm. And that then begins to create this trauma in the collective and in society. And it leads to a lot of instability. And you start to question things like, we were the greatest country and what happened? Like, Why are there other countries now doing better than us, for example? Hmm. Um, And all of this really came out with 9-11, right? And it's coming out now as well with current events too. But your question about like your younger sister, right? She might not have really understood what was going on, but she was having these nightmares. Yeah. And this actually kind of, she was obviously alive during the event, but this, this comes to this idea of sort of, intergenerational trauma as Mm -hmm. well right so for example the holocaust um you and i we we didn't live through it right but we're told stories about it and we're probably told stories about it since we were like live Mm -hmm. um other events that have might have happened the way that we keep these like world war one world war two read the revolutionary war we memorialize these events right by having monuments and memorials and museums and stuff like that. And yes, this is good in a way because it reminds us to not forget and to grow from what happened. But these types of public monuments and rituals, though they're important in the process of grief and mourning, Mm -hmm. they also remind you of what has happened, right? It reminds us that we are survivors, it reminds us to pick and choose the story that we wanna tell. But it also can be very triggering for someone. It can start to build the story in their mind. Mm -hmm. So though that they're really, really beneficial, these monuments also lock in the types of feelings that were had about that situation. Mm -hmm. 
And you almost like lock them into the marble and the concrete and the metal, right? That's making these monuments. So every time you look at them, it's an experience of loss visually and spatially that's represented. Yeah. And it's, it's that unspoken emotion that we've now solidified. So even though your sister might've been what, like six or eight or something, like she didn't have a full understanding, but she lived through it. And now when she sees reminders of it, she still knows and she's built the story that she was surrounded by. Yeah. That, the, the story building, I feel like anyone we talk to around our age has that story of like where they were when they heard, because I remember exactly where I was. I was in Mr. Shrank's class. Mr. <laughs> Shrank. And he told us that he wouldn't tell us what exactly had happened, but he said it was just like Pearl Harbor. So of course we're all like, oh my God, that like the implications of that and kind of seeing like the scope, like looking to the future, like how many years is this going to affect? And I mean, I feel like I am privileged and, and lucky. Like I know a lot of people that day did start off a chain of events that you know was with them every single day mm -hmm. um especially like losing someone like I can't even and you know what it is is that whether it was Pearl Harbor or 9-11 or Vietnam or the atomic bomb or slavery or even family separation mm -hmm. the central theme to the emotional experience is helplessness mm -hmm. and with helplessness at the core of it you you cause the anxiety you cause the grief you cause the sadness right and it's really can we take a step back and have a moment of introspection mm -hmm. and that's really the key part in the developmental process is like can we step back look inside ourselves and tolerate these very painful feelings that we're having that are caused by helplessness. So like sorrow and disappointment and guilt. Mm -hmm. And that's the stage that we wanna get to in healing because when you think about trauma, you have to, it's basically based on five major themes, right? And these are the five themes that get shattered when something traumatic happens. And it's mm -hmm. safety, trust, power and control, esteem and intimacy. And so when you do trauma work and healing, um, in therapy, it's really about how do we create a fabric again that's strong for you in those five themes of safety, trust, power, and control, esteem, and intimacy, and rebuild those. Does anybody actually have all five of those down? I don't believe so in my mind, because we have all been through experiences, and experiences affect those themes. Yeah. And at various points in life, you have different levels of those themes. And, um, you know, we, we have to start to not be in denial. And when we touch on collective denial, we start to touch on that collective unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. And we might be in denial, but if you walk into a room of a group of people who are shared a, shared a traumatic experience, even if they're not speaking, they tend to sense what's going on in each other's bodies due to the level of stress that's present in the room. Mm. And once we start to, you know, once we stop denying that, we can have a sense of release. Hmm. And we can have a sense of release from our actual nervous system physically. So there's like a chemical part to this too? <laughs> Totally. I mean, you know, it's basically like, as we spoke about earlier, everything that happens in your life, even if it's not stored as a conscious memory, it's stored in your body. Right. And so when you are put into a situation that might resemble that, those similar emotions are going to come up again. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and when we think about that collectively as a collective trauma, it's a group of people that have that storage now in their nervous system together that share it and they will all react in a very similar way um, to a stressor so when yeah. you're when mr frank was like oh it's like pearl harbor yeah that's what he associated with and you know i guarantee you that 
when 9-11 happened, it reactivated the physical reaction that he might have had when he found out about Pearl Harbor happening as a kid. Wow. Oh, how are we all functioning? That's a big, <laughs> how are we all doing this? Um, we'll come back to that. You can think on the answer <laughs> to that and we'll come back to it. Um, in terms of that numb feeling, I think I recognize it in myself for sure. I think I recognized it in a lot of media. I read recently that September 11th is, was 20 years ago. And yeah, I've only just started accepting that like grief doesn't have an end. Like there's just, there's no like, all right, it's been 20 years. Like, congratulations. Here's the finish line. Like it is going to be with us forever. Mm -hmm. um, but then I started, I was like, oh, I'll look into some of the the horrible things that happened that day and see kind of what I remember versus like what really happened. And when I started even just like reading the numbers, like the death, like definitely went into panic mode and I was like, no, like it's too, I, I sentences, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So how can we face a collective trauma still using 9-11 as an example um, without falling into a rabbit hole of despair? <laughs> Yeah, that's really tough. And you know, the thing, I was actually up on the World Trade Center in August of 2001. Oh my um, gosh. And it's like the first time I went as a, as a kid that could remember, right? And so I remember, and I have photos of me, with like my cousin who was visiting and my parents. And it was particularly terrifying for me when I found out it happened because I had just been there like a few weeks before. Yeah. Um, and... <laughs> So the, th the thing about it is that it's really horrible what happened. No one is denying that. It's heartbreaking. It's really unimaginable and unbelievable. The way that people survived in some of those situations that are horrible like that is to heavily dissociate. Mm -hmm. um, but even by, by heavily dissociating, all you're really doing is suppressing and fragmenting the inf information right? And the stimuli, it's not really disappearing. And that actually leads to it continuing to stay within the collective and also within generations. So how do we continue to process and grief and grieve without falling back into full despair is trying to put meaning to something, right? I think as a whole, it's, it's, <laughs> you're we're laughing, back. but you know, the no, thing is, like, we're back to Victor Frankl, my favorite. Yeah, it, we guess we are. <laughs> and it's right behind me. It's trying to put meaning to something. And that's not to say like, you're in a traumatic event. It's like, this must be happening because I'm going to come out of this really good. It's like, mm -hmm. no, if you're in a traumatic event, you're in a traumatic event and it like, it sucks. And you can appreciate that it sucks. And you can acknowledge that it sucks and be sad and shitty about it. But to heal from a trauma is to bring back meaning to what that crisis was and what you're going to grow from and rebuild that fabric in your life. And so coming back to this, this fact of like, we have created a public monument and a memorial, right, for what happened at 9-11. Mm -hmm. And we are using that as a way to continue to mourn and to grief in a healthy manner and to never forget what happened and to come out stronger from it. Obviously, emotions will come out, feelings will come out, and it's okay for that to happen. But again, that's part of that process of rebuilding those five themes of trauma and rebuilding your own foundational fabric is like being able to learn to acknowledge, appreciate, and tolerate the painful feelings that come up. Mm -hmm. And over time, they will not impact you as much in a negative way. And the thing is, like, you know, the fact that you're saying that you're having these emotional reactions, like it, it just makes me love you even more because it means that you have not become numb to it and that it actually has meaning for you and there's value to it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I mean, I, that's really nice to hear. And I hope anyone else who's listening 
who is feeling feelings about it knows that it makes them a person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, it is the sob cast, so we can have a cry if we if we have to. I might cry. I don't know anymore, but <laughs> but it's huh. it's really interesting, right? Because it's like it's it's pretty wild. I I thought a lot about nine eleven as this whole pandemic thing was going down because mm. nine eleven had such an impact, and with the pandemic, it was like it's like chronic trauma yeah and it reminded me of the difference between ptsd and cptsd right or complex ptsd and one of the major differences is the fact that with complex ptsd there's sort of an ongoing trigger Uh an ongoing traumatic event Mm -hmm. and 9-11 caused ptsd in society as a collective um the covid pandemic is continuing to happen it's an ongoing traumatic event right now still and as a whole, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens when you have a world that has dealt with now with chronic and complex PTSD. Yeah. And how are we going to recover from that? I Something that's coming up for me is um, thinking about the Canterbury Tales, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> where <laughs> um, Chaucer wrote about these people escaping the plague and it turned into these like hilarious stories I mean even now they're ridiculous and I don't know I just gotta tip my hat I guess to yeah you know there's been some pretty cool COVID stories right like (laughs) well you know I I needed some feel good in my life and and I I was watching season two of Modern Love oh um, yeah and there was this really awesome episode of this girl who's on a train back from university to Dublin to her mom's and it's in, it's in Ireland. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, she's like this really cute nerdy girl. And like, I totally would go sit and talk to her if I was on that train. But, (laughs) um, and then this guy comes and they talk and like, you know, at the end they get off and they don't exchange numbers. They just say, Oh, like this lockdown is going to be done in two weeks. We'll just meet at the train. And it's this beautiful love story that happens. Right. And where they fight past the pandemic and the lockdown to see each other. And I just gave it away, but it's a true story. And like there's story, that's one of a million, I'm sure of just beautiful stories that have come up. Um, And just, I think also personal growth and like Viktor Frankl's whole man search for meaning, you know, he was in like one of the most extreme traumatic situations that we can think of in human history. Yeah. And it gave him time to have all of these thoughts. And I'm hoping with the pandemic that we had, people finally had a moment to pause and to catch up on decades of suppressed emotions and feelings that they've had. Because we're good at ignoring things. (laughs) Yeah, and it's like, oh man, okay. And you know, the thing about it is like, we keep saying it's building resilience in all of us, but like you can be resilient, you can still be suffering. So I don't want people Mm. to, you know, misconstrue that term. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Um, For those of you who don't know Viktor Frankl's work, I do want to touch on it. Um, Man's Search for Meaning was a book that we talked about the last time you were on the podcast and changed my life. I think about it probably like once a week. It's amazing. It is amazing and it's about a psychologist right Victor Frankl's a psychologist yeah psychotherapist psychiatrist I believe I'm I am finding that I'm often getting psychologist psychiatrist psychologist he's all the above he's all the above (laughs) I get them all mixed up he's a legend he's a legend yeah Victor Frankl comma legend was um in the concentration camps and um basically had a theory that if you put meaning to events in your life that will lead you to not just happiness but literally staying alive and um the instances that he saw that proved that point are horrific um and also weirdly beautiful and I don't know yeah uh, you know I try to live by his 
this method of it's considered logotherapy, which is essentially, you know, that idea of putting meaning to the worst situations that you can be in. Mm -hmm. Um, But I encourage people to also acknowledge that it's a shitty situation when you're in one. Yeah. Yeah. I Um, think there's like a, a kind of a toxic positivity that I definitely struggle with where it's just like, it's fine. Like we're moving on. It's back to normal. And some of the, that language is really triggering and kind of harmful yeah. when you're not yeah. feeling well yet and you're not there. It can be like, oh my God, am I supposed to? And then that's just like one more thing to be upset about. Because you know what happens is like, if we don't acknowledge things and we just are like, okay, okay, it happened, it happened, got to move on. Yeah. Then you fall into this whole like transgenerational problem where it gets passed on to your kids, right? So think about just like, uh, think about like, okay, a dad or a grandfather who was once starved in a concentration camp Mm -hmm. and didn't really process that. They then maybe press on their child to bulk up and be in competitive sports, right? To do the opposite or like a suffering parent insists that a child show gratitude and deny any pain emotionally or physically that they might be having. Yeah. So it's a balance, you know, I love Viktor Frankl. I love this concept of finding meaning in things and, and I try to do it as much as I can, but I've also realized like when something sucks, it sucks. And you, the, the faster we are to acknowledge that and to process it and to pause and feel and go head to toe and really observe what's going on, yeah. you know, the better we are for it. And then we can really move forward with that meaning. This might be kind of ridiculous I never know but (laughs) something about the pandemic that has had meaning for me and kind of lifted my spirits like one iota has weirdly been this collective feeling like whoa we all have this thing in common now like there's there are so many ways that we misunderstand each other and now when we talk about like lockdown everyone knows what that is and some sense of what that feels like. Uh, yeah. yeah. We, and, and, and looking at these collective traumas that we've had in the past and the one we have now, this one is unique in the sense that it, the world is connected, right? Not just our, well, yes, our community, but our definition of community has expanded to become the world versus our neighborhood or our, village or a city Mm -hmm. and um it might sound counterintuitive but if we can start to think about that then we can really move forward a lot more as a collective so it's this concept of like we've thought about collective traumas historically but we've never really thought about how do you heal the collective yeah giant band-aid the yeah, biggest I think that's a band-aid. good idea. Like the biggest Prozac pill you can find. <laughs> and we're and all just, just like, like nibbling on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, throw it, just throw it in the mix. <laughs> Jeff Bezos, get on it. Come on. <laughs> I think he's he's just going to, no, he's out of the world. He's just in space these days. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to like launch a Prozac pill <laughs> safely at all of us. Yeah. I don't know. Want to improve your mental health, but don't know where to start? The Dive Through app helps you self-regulate your emotions using feeling tracking, journaling, and interactive courses that are developed by mental health professionals. With Dive Through, you can feel confident that you have the tools to live a mentally healthier and more fulfilling life. Download the Dive Through app for free on the App Store or Google Play. The Artist Way is... I think a 12 week program, basically a book that you do by yourself. And um, it's supposed to kind of clear up a lot of blockages that you have with art. And one of the main proponents of the activity book is that every morning you wake up and you write three pages before you like talk to anyone or like for me, what was hard was like before I looked at my phone. So I would write letters to Julia Hurt. The author's name is Julia Cameron. And I'd be like, dear Julia, I am not doing good. (laughs) 
And that weirdly, that helped a lot because it did really actually successfully open up a lot of blockages that I was having in terms of like perfectionism. Um, uh, for so long, my way of processing things has been making funny things for the internet. And mm-hmm. I did not, that did not feel appropriate. And it made me feel worse because I felt like I should be able to do that. So being able to like make things that were just for the sake of making them, it's so easy to talk about. And, and I think actually a lot harder to do, but I finally did that. And that's continued to be helpful journaling and like even just like doodling. Um, I've been doing a lot of tarot card reading. Oh man, can we, we should do that. I want to do some of that with you. Oh my God, please. I love it. I love it so much. I'll do it anytime. Like I've been like tracking the moon. And so like on new moons and full moons, I will take the time to light candles and that's really the only time I feel not silly doing like affirmations. I have a really mm-hmm. weird uh, relationship with affirmations because, and I think that's like something about the esteem part of what you're talking about. Yeah. I, I'll be like, I am strong. And then like in the back of my head, I'm like, you're, you're dummy. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> so you know what, you know who you're, you know what you remind me of is this quote by E.E. E. Cummings. Oh my God. I love E.E. Cummings too. Oh. And it's the most, the most wasted of all days is one without laughter. Oh, I love that so much. He's so, so good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I guess also like finding laughter that didn't necessarily have to be on the internet too. is good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like the ritual of the tarot and lighting candles and things like that. Like I grew up Catholic but that it doesn't, that's a whole other episode, but there is something that I think I find so comforting from childhood of lighting candles and almost praying. And mm-hmm. it's just like, now I'm actually praying to myself at this point. Cause I'm like, it's up to you to make yourself, to heal yourself and like get all the help you can. So I don't know. I'm yeah. trying to think of other things, but those have been really the main ones, I think. I love I, that. I don't know that that's actually work. I'm I, I'm curious to see how collective trauma is going to be affecting me forever. Uh, I'm sure it will. I don't, I'm trying really hard not to avoid stuff, but I, even sometimes recording these podcasts, even just talking, I don't know if you can hear, I like get like stopped up because mm-hmm. my body literally does not want me to get into that because it's like oh we're gonna be upset now really and I'm like yeah how do we not be upset it's it's a really bizarre time and it's very upsetting so (laughs) well if you I sometimes I try to think about myself as like a leaf and (laughs) we start at the top of the mountain in the river and we're floating down and throughout life we have these experiences and we have obstacles and sometimes it slows down and it's smooth and it's smooth and then there's a waterfall and you go down and then you're smooth again Mm -hmm. and similar to that it's basically just a representation of us right in our spirit in our life and we're faced with lessons we're faced with obstacles that we have to go around with beautiful scenes with scary scenes, with fears, with energies of all forms. Mm -hmm. And that helps us to become who we are. And then the perfection of who we are is this ability to actually fully express a range of emotions, right? Yeah. And when you notice yourself not being able to express a range of emotions, that's, that's problematic, right? And that, that means that there's, there's something going on that you are dissociating so much. Sounds right. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to just encourage you to like feel what you're feeling. Um, hmm. And you're going to grow from it. And as you do that, you actually end up contributing to the unified consciousness and the unified healing that we have as a collective society. I'm so glad you 
brought that up because that was one of my big questions actually I don't want this to sound like pressure on listeners I want it to feel more like an exciting opportunity that when you're working on yourself you're actually working on the collective can you speak Mm -hmm. a little bit on how like yeah you might be a leaf in the river but like there are tons of trees around and like there are leaves everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And you're sure. <laughs> I totally butchered yeah, your metaphor. It, I'm sorry. No, it's it's hard, right? It's hard to I'm seeing this as a, as a as a psychiatrist, right? And it sounds like woo-woo to some people, but it's this idea that, and I truly believe this, is that we are one being and then there's you, and then there's animals and creatures in the e- ecosystem. And we all work together functionally. And, you know, yes, we have our five senses that we are aware of, but there are definitely other ones that we're just not aware of, right? Because mm-hmm. the perspective that humans take is that we are the center of the universe. And are we really though? Like, <laughs> not really, like we're a sliver in time. So I truly believe that when you are able to hate saying the term like work on yourself but when you are able to invest in yourself Mm -hmm. right you actually you actually contribute to the whole collective because Mm -hmm. by investing in yourself you are there then present emotionally and physically to help those around you and to actually contribute intentionally to the surroundings around you so it's almost like if you think about the metaphor of climate change, it's like, oh, why would I do anything? Like, I can't change this. Like, I'm not going to like lower emissions on my own. But when you do it, it has an impact. It has an impact even in your micro environment, which is drastic. And so other organisms, other plants, other beings, other food systems, they depend on us too. We work synergistically. We can't just take, take and take. We've done that long enough and we've seen the impact of it. So it, it's hard to rationalize and think like how the hell like working on myself and spending money on therapy gonna help me or spending money going to the gym gonna help me or buying organic food gonna help me how is that like relevant but just think about that every time you make an investment whether it's financially through your wallet or whatever Mm -hmm. you're voting for the world you want to live in and And when you invest in yourself, you're voting for that world that you want. And you might not win, but that's the point of having a vote. So, you know, you do your part and hopefully as a collective, we can start to create that world that we want. Because it's not like the collective has ever been perfect. Like, it's not like we, there's no like bygone era of like, oh, if only we could be like back in... Oh, the 1800s or like, yeah, but it was the 1200s some, like, miss it. <laughs> there was probably some caveman that was like a huge narcissist, you know, like, come yeah. on. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, I'm going to eat this whole thing. Peace. <laughs> exactly. Like there's just no, there is no end to it. It's just. So it's- no, so this is, it's, it's difficult. I think, um, you know, let's just acknowledge the fact that we are still in this trauma and it's mm-hmm. not even just like, it wasn't just COVID right? It wasn't just COVID. It led to people in a state of helplessness are seeking answers. And whether it's, we blame the government, we blame certain groups, ethnic groups, minority groups, or whatever. We blame China. People are looking to point their fingers at like, why is this happening to us? And it's in a state of helplessness. And we know the types of events that have happened over the past two years Mm -hmm. because of that. So it's if at the end of the day we can look back on the past two years and recognize like society is is hurting and we all need to come together Mm -hmm. we all need to come together to really create what we want to see and where we want to live and i've been hearing from a lot of people that they're still so overwhelmed with financial stuff and like how their kids are at home or like 
they have to go to work and it's terrifying and they're nervous about getting sick or someone has been sick or just, you know, I, I guess I don't really have to list all the things that we're all worried about because everyone knows that we're all worried <laughs> about a lot of things. Like, where can we start? <laughs> Like, what is one thing we can just do today to, or even just this week or this month that will even set us up to get set up, to be setting up, to maybe set up, to get better, feel better? Yeah, I think that the one thing I would encourage people is to start to think about mental hygiene. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Um, I like that right. So it's like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, it's, it's sort of like, cool. You brush your teeth and shower, like hopefully, right. I mean, not everyone can do what they want, but hopefully like <laughs> you, you, do some, we, you do some like basic hygiene stuff physically. So like, wh why do we not treat our brains and our emotions the same way? Um, so I'd encourage people to like actually begin to invest into your mental hygiene. And that can literally be like, two minutes in the morning of writing something down for the day mm. or doing a quick meditation or pausing to have a cup of coffee or tea or whatever, mm -hmm. just do something. And then you'll start to see the benefits of that for yourself. Cause a, it's a routine B it's something to ground yourself. So that's what I would really encourage. Yes. Financial stress, unemployment, living, like all these things are, they're drastic. Um, and those problems are, they're huge. And you know, I, I hope that one of the positive consequences that we've learned is the value of what really matters to us over this past year and whether that's family and friends or yourself and your own life and starting to invest in that. So if there's one thing I can tell people, it's think about mental hygiene and create a routine for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that routine can even just be two minutes. I guess yeah. is something I'm taking. From uh, yeah, I've been doing this thing called Two Minute Journal. Oh, is that like the book? Like it it's comes a little book. A book? Yeah, awesome. yeah. It's basically like I'm grateful for blank. I'm letting go of blank, and today I want to do one, two, and three. Oh, that's cool. Do you think about what you wrote down during the day? Yeah, that's cool. I really like. I think that kind of goes along with that, like affirmation situation of like, I don't know, putting words to your um, desire to feel better, honestly, can mm -hmm. help just because then like, let's say like something you want to accomplish is like, I want to do yoga for 20 minutes or like, I want to make sure my entire inbox is cleared so that tomorrow I'm not overwhelmed when I is go that to possible work. no no I'm, yeah. I'm living a yeah. dream life that's a dream life. I don't know who I know some people can do it though some people do it I just can't I it's not possible I'm like a 30,000 emails kind of gal I hope that doesn't stress anyone out who's listening to this but I mean then when you're like kind of choosing between for me it'd be like I just want to like lay down and do my Netflix show um, and doing 20 <laughs> minutes of yoga, like, because I said it all those hours ago, I don't know there. I feel like yeah. you're a little more likely to do it, which is crazy yeah. that that works, but <laughs> it's true. It's true. And it's, it's, it's routine and rhythm and yeah. Like, have you heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah. Okay. So have you ever thought about your personal hierarchy of needs? No. no, have you? <laughs> so, yeah, I was thinking a lot about it this past year, and I was like, Maslow's cool, like whatever. But like, what about like Ragu's hierarchy of needs? Uh, and right, and so I started to realize, like, oh, I need calm and nature and nurture and community and experiences, and I, I need that time to step away. And so I, I created like my own little pyramid. Oh, I love and nutrition. That. Yeah. And so I think that's like a really cool exercise to do as well. I know I'm not anybody's teacher, but that could be really good homework. I'm just saying. It <laughs> is good homework. homework. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm definitely going to do that. That's so interesting. Because I bet it, is, it can surprise you, I think, like what's 
important. Yeah. And it's like the stuff helps, you know, a lot of people are talking about mental health and like well-being and stuff. And they all are like journal, do this, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's like, dude, just do whatever works for you. Cause life is way too short to keep spending it at war with your mind. Just get it out somehow and move forward. Yeah. Oh, being at war with your mind. That's so you asked me earlier how I've been dealing with the times. What other things have you been doing? <laughs> what are, what the are modern, your hierarchy of needs? The modern time. Well, I can't say modern times. That's a brewery. The times. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I, I've kind of followed the script most of my life. And I think that it's gotten to me where I am, gotten me to where I am, which I'm generally, generally happy about. Um, but I've also realized with the pandemic, like what I've neglected, Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that was like myself, uh, whether it was my personal life or my personal health and well-being and pushing myself to the grind in terms of, in terms of work saying that you got to hustle to make it happen, you know, and like doing podcasts and being on all these other things on top of the clinical work during a pandemic it like drove me to the ground. And, you know, I remember very clearly July 3rd, 2020. Yes. July 3rd, 2020, <laughs> I was like lying in bed. I think it was a Friday night and uh, I just like, couldn't move. I was like frozen. And I was so, I just got this like huge sense of, I mean, I'm pretty sure I had like some just depression baseline most of the time before that but like I just got this like huge sense of it and I was like damn this sucks like and passive as like passive thoughts of death right like nothing serious really like our intent but it was like it it scares you when it even has like you have fleeting thoughts Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um I was like damn this is it was like a wake-up call but it was also it brought meaning to like my work and to be like, this is what people are going through right now. And, or worse, right? And so yeah. I got a glimpse into the other person in the room when I'm working in clinic. Mm-hmm. And um, it was important to acknowledge that. And it also made me realize that as a healthcare professional, frontline worker, as a psychiatrist, even it is important for me to speak up about that. The fact that we are also dealing with it and that we are burnt the hell out. I mean, I didn't just do psychiatry. I went and covered medicine and did COVID coverage during one of the waves. It's like the toll that it's taken on my colleagues and friends in the space has been so dramatic that it was a huge wake up call. And so I really started to value myself. This is a long winded answer to Mm -hmm. tell you what I do, but I started to value myself and say like, time's up, you know, and um, you gotta take care of yourself. And so I started to be a little bit more um, strict about diet, like nutrition and what I'm putting in my body. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cause I have, you can have control over that to some degree. Mm-hmm. So I tried to be a little bit more um, aware of that, started to cook more, which is very meditative for me and also very healthy for me. I made sure to at least go outside on a, like a big major hike at least once a week mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. when safe with like a small community of people that I, you know, could pod with mm-hmm. um, and just had that as an outlet, not just for the physical exercise, but for the connection with one another and to have that support and that family. Um, and also my family became important. And so I tried to enhance my relationship with like my parents and my brother and now my one-year-old nephew who was born during the pandemic. Whoa. Oh my gosh. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. So there's stuff like that. And then, you know, I think it's just movement, mindfulness, meditation for me has been so critical and writing. Like I have been writing poems um, I am such a firm believer that everyone is a poet and anyone can write that I I deny your air quotes. Okay, <laughs> I deny okay. you your air quotes. 
Yeah, so I've been trying to write poems, and it's been a great outlet for emotions and and um, the feels. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, and I use PIM. <laughs> yeah, okay, go on. You want to talk about PIM? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I use PIM, which um, it does it does add, it does genuinely help me um, calm feelings of stress and overwhelm, and uh, it's something that I really love and I'm invested in you know, I'm working alongside the team. It was started by a very dear friend of mine named Zach Williams, who unfortunately lost his father, Robin Williams, that we all grew up with and love and is such an inspiring, inspiring, inspiring human, um, especially from Patch Adams yeah. uh, as oh the doctor. Gosh, yeah. um, and I fortunately, you know, got to meet Zach and we really bonded during the pandemic and we started a company called PIM as a way to really basically help people feel like them their best selves, right? Yeah. And um, a lot of the, U the global population is deficit in amino acids okay. and vitamins, right? And yeah. it's probably because that we're living in a world where we're not actually getting the types of foods and things that we need for ourselves. We're getting a lot of processed things. Mm -hmm. And when you have these deficiencies, it leads to things like mental health issues, emotional well-being issues. So what we're really doing is creating products to help um, supplement those deficiencies, but only natural products. So mm -hmm. GABA is one of the most common inhibitory neurotransmitters. It helps us feel calm. A lot of people are deficit in it. We have a a fruit gusher style chew yep. that basically has GABA in it. It has L-thionine from green tea and it has rhodiola, which helps with your mood as well. And it's all natural. And so we are basically creating this product line along with working with clients to help develop a nutritional psychiatry approach to hmm. enhance their lives. And this is all in, this is all in augmentation or in, parallel with medication if they need it, right? We're not trying to replace any of that. So we're just trying to create an approach in which people can invest in their mental health and emotional well-being and be proactive and not reactive. Yeah. That, do you think that this um, company would have happened if not for the pandemic? Yes, I do. I, I, I think that uh, you know, Zach, Zach's a huge mental health advocate, um, especially after his own experience uh, in his family, you know, he began to advocate a lot for other nonprofits in the mental health space and so forth. And so seeing him build this company and being able to be a part of it, it's been like truly inspiring for me. I think the pandemic maybe has accelerated um, the need for something like this. Yeah. Wow. That's it. So, I mean, I guess this is a cliche for a reason, but it sounds like you're turning lemons into lemonade and the lemonade has, I'm trying. has uh, nutrients in it. That's good. <laughs> Coming to your question of how do we heal as a collective from a trauma? Mm -hmm. It's learning that we need to make changes like this where we can't have food deserts anymore. Mm -hmm. we, we need to be able to say, we as a country have the capacity to create companies like Whole Foods and Erewhon, why are we not investing in having those in every neighborhood? Yeah. Is there anything that we can do right now to, I don't know, who do we even talk to about that? I'm like, where's the adult? I need an adult. <laughs> You're the adult. I'm looking at you. No, I don't want to be the adult. And that, gi and that gigantic telephone behind you. It doesn't even work. It doesn't, it's plugged into <laughs> nothing. It does nothing. I'm not an adult. It's all an illusion. It looks like one of those phones that you can make like really big decisions on. Dang it. All right. Okay. I will meditate and you're, like, with the phone. you're like smoking a pipe. I know. I want one of those like long, long cigarette holders. Yeah. <laughs> That's like a stage cigarette, you know, like where you blow yeah. into it instead of. <laughs> but, you know, this comes to your whole question about like, what can I do for myself that helps the collective? It's that. It's like advocating mm -hmm. in your own communities. I'm nodding. 
Yes. Yeah. <sighs> I think that every single person does have a purpose in that we all have really different strengths and really different weaknesses. And I would like to implore anybody who feel like feels like their strength is causing a ruckus about bettering the world that I'm really happy that you have that strength because I, I feel really overwhelmed by that. And, uh, I want to help, but I'm glad that there are people who wake up in the morning and who are like, I, I would like to put a whole foods in every city or, you know, just make sure people are protected and safe and well, this is your strength. This is your strength is you're, you're making difficult conversations and topics relatable and spreading it to an audience, right? And so everyone does have a strength, as do you. You get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> um, just FYI, I'm not being paid to say any of this. I don't know. I'm slipping you like a... <laughs> Like a Krispy Kreme coupon. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> well, we're actually um, at the end of our time together, which is crazy because that went by really fast. But um, do you have any last words of advice or any other E.E. E. Cummings quotes that have come to your mind while we've been talking <laughs> that you'd like to share? You know, um, Life would be easier if we had, if we were born and someone handed us a user manual about ourselves. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not the case, but mm -hmm. just start to appreciate who you are and just embrace all the experiences, bring meaning when you need it, but develop a hierarchy for yourself on what you need. Yes, Please. I can't wait. I hope people do that and share it so we can see it and totally. we'll just be like yes yeah because I'm really tired of you know ruminating in my mind and having this like civil war mm -hmm. and so and I'm pretty sure everyone else is too so it's time to start living and playing thank you so much for hanging out with me today it would super help if you subscribed, left a review, call your grandma, tell her to listen. And if you want more, Sobcast the podcast, follow us on Instagram. All right. See you next week. Love you. Bye.